Welcome back to the lectures on chemistry as part of the national program on technology enhanced learning funded by the ministry of human resource development. This is a series of lectures given to students in their uh, primary co the college years in engineering and in basic sciences. Okay. The uh, chemistry module that we will continue today is the same as the atoms and molecules. In the last lecture, if you recall, I introduced to the idea that quantum chemistry is fundamentally important in understanding uh, why molecules form, uh, why molecules undergo transformations to form various newer species, and how do we understand the structure, properties, and the chemical transformations of molecules. Uh, how do we do this from first principles? If we ask these questions, then quantum chemistry provides the answers. And therefore, this, uh, the first module on the atoms and molecules is uh, meant to expose you to the use of quantum chemistry techniques. I was categorical in the last lecture that we are not trying to understand quantum chemistry or quantum mechanics, but rather we are trying to follow through a prescription or a procedures by which we use the rules of the mechanics and hopefully over a period of time that we will understand why such rules came into place. Before I begin my lecture, let me welcome you to, with uh, this acknowledgement to the National Program on Technology Enhanced Learning. My name is Mangala Sundar. I am from the Department of Chemistry, Indian Institute of Technology, Madras at Chennai. We will start studying model problems in quantum chemistry and uh, we will start with the simple free particles in one and two dimensions. But before we do that, let me just recollect to you some of the most important names in quantum mechanics. In today's lecture, I will give you some of the important names of quantum, uh, some of the important founders of the mechanics and in subsequent lectures, I will also introduce you to the illustrious uh, uh, chemists who have contributed to all of our knowledge as of today. Okay. The people who made our understanding of the atoms and molecules possible, a few names, most important ones. Max Planck, we introduced uh, Max Planck in the last lecture through his constant and his phenomenon of uh, the black body radiation. Albert Einstein undoubtedly the most famous physicist ever to have lived in the last century, whose contribution to the physics in general and to quantum mechanics in particular are unparalleled. Niels Bohr, a Danish physicist whose name is familiar to all of you from your high school textbooks on the planetary model of the hydrogen atom, the orbits of the electrons in the hydrogen atom. You recall Niels Bohr was the first to apply the quantum uh, hypothesis to understand the spectra of hydrogen, the line spectra of hydrogen in terms of the Lyman series, the Balmer series, the Parshan series and so on. You recall that there was a famous constant called the Rydberg constant which Niels Bohr uh, explained through fundamental uh, methods. Louis de Broglie brought in the idea a French physicist who brought in the idea that the 
uh, matter can be treated both as particulate or as well as wave like. So, this wave particle duality which eventually led Erwin Schrodinger the Austrian physicist to ask questions what are the governing dynamical equations for uh, substances which behave both wave like and particle like. Louis de Broglie was the founder of this matter wave ideas. Max Born on the uh, left hand side. Max Born's contributions in physics in general are very well known, but in this particular reference to the chemistry, it is his interpretation of the quantum mechanical wave function. This absolute square of the wave function being identified with the probability density of the system. We will see those things a little bit more in detail. Werner Heisenberg, very well known for his uncertainty principle. You must have heard the joke that the Heisenberg may have been here to indicate the uncertainty associated with position and velocity, okay, position and momentum. It is a cornerstone for quantum mechanics. Erwin Schrodinger, the most important name for all the chemists because all the chemists, quantum chemists, computational chemists, the ones who do theory, the ones who try to understand chemistry from first principles have to solve the Schrodinger equation, have to understand how to solve Schrodinger equations both analytically and through the use of computers. Paul Dirac, the man on the right hand side, contributed to the development of quantum mechanics through his relativistic theory of electrons, his contributions. In fact, he made such a famous statement that all of the mechanics as is necessary for the applications of chemistry are well known and it is only a question of computational difficulty that we will have to surmount. Paul Dirac's name is very famous among computational chemists for the statements that he made and for the developments in computational chemistry which has happened in the last uh, 50, 60 years. People understand that Dirac gave the basic formulation in terms of unifying quantum mechanics through his ever famous book called The Principles of Quantum Mechanics. Wolfgang Pauli is the other person that again chemists know. Pauli's exclusion principle in your high school when you build up the electronic structure of an atom by adding electrons to various orbitals, you are told that no more than two electrons for any orbital. No two electrons can have all the same four quantum numbers. That is one of the many important things that Wolfgang Pauli did and which is fundamental to the atomic structure in chemistry. Let us go back to the lecture that we have today, namely the model solutions of the quantum problems that we introduced, the Schrodinger equation that needs to be solved for simple models and from the models we try and understand the results in terms of simple physical pictures and we see that the pictures that come out of these solutions are quite different from what we are familiar from our realization of what happens around us, okay. what happens in the atoms, in subatomic, in microscopic domain microscopic dimensions seem so strange that we have to see this only through the mathematics and the corresponding solutions of the mathematical equation first proposed by Erwin Schrodinger. So, let me summarize the, the content of today's lecture before we go into the details. We will solve the free particle in a box in one dimensional model problem and also in a two dimensional model problem and given some time I would like to give you pictorial representations of the wave functions and squares of the wave function. Let me recollect from the previous lecture the Schrodinger equation that we wrote down for the particle in a one dimensional box. You recall that there was a 
kinetic energy term minus h bar square by 2 m d square by d x square the operator corresponding to the kinetic energy plus the potential energy of the particle or of the system that we are interested in the potential energy experienced by the particle all of this was called the Hamiltonian which represents in classical mechanics this total energy of the system classical kinetic energy now this is quantum mechanical quantum mechanical kinetic energy plus the quantum mechanical potential energy acting on the wave function psi h psi of x is equal to e psi of x e psi of x this is the equation governing the wave function psi of x if we know the particle's mass and if we know the potential energy that the particle is facing then we are able to formulate the Hamiltonian of the system but then we have to solve the differential equation h psi is equal to e psi where e is a constant. Okay. This is a model problem. Now why is particle in a 1D box for chemists? Think about a simple system like a conjugated polyenes. You know what this means alternating single and double bond structures. Polymeric if you want to the simplest structure for this is the butadiene with of course you can put the hydrogens to ensure that the chemical bonding of carbon is uh, taken care of. The pi electrons the pi electrons which are this in the double bonded structure the pi electrons are easily modeled to a first approximation by an equation similar to that of a particle in a one dimensional box equation. If you want to know something about what these molecules do when they absorb light or when you excite them where the electrons go and things like that yet to a certain approximation we can understand that by solving the Schrodinger equation for a one dimensional particle in a box. Therefore the relevance is in trying to understand a corresponding chemical system. Okay. Now let us go back to the model. The particle in the 1D model is of course as I wrote down minus h bar square by 2 m d square psi by d x square plus v of psi is equal to e of psi but with the specific requirement that this potential vanishes in a small region the region of the box the length of the box if the particle moves in one dimension x the length of the box is a you see that the potential is 0 in that period, in that region and the potential is infinite otherwise so that the particle does not escape the box. Okay. Simple pictorial representation of the box is something like what you see here. Okay. The particle moves inside this region. Okay. What I had as A there in the equation is replaced now by L is the length of the box 0 to L x is the variable the particle is moving in a one dimensional motion we do not know where it is we all know that it is inside the box it cannot escape the box and that the potentials at the ends of the box are infinity infinite repulsive so that the particle stays inside the box this is the model we want to solve. Now let us go back to that equation since the v is 0 inside the box we can simply rewrite this equation as minus h bar square by 2 m d square psi by d x square is equal to e psi or we can bring this constant to this side and then bring the whole thing back here to write this equation as d square psi by d x square plus 2 m e by h bar square psi of x 
is equal to 0. Okay. The energy of a moving particle is always positive and therefore this particular constant 2 m e by h bar square you know what a h bar is h bar is h by 2 pi h is the Planck's constant please keep that in your mind. So this equation is to represent it in simple term is a d square psi by dx square plus a constant k square psi is equal to 0. The particle in the one dimensional box gives you with this kind of approximation gives you the simplest Schrodinger equation to solve. Even from the simplest Schrodinger equation some of the consequences that you draw from the solution are rattling. I mean, they, are, they are difficult to recognize as anything familiar. Therefore, even a simple model like this has in it the newness, the discreteness of the energy coming out of it as we see in a few minutes. Okay. The solution of this equation is a simple mathematical equation. You must know how to solve this. If not, let me write down the solution here as psi of x is equal to a cosine k of x using real functions and b sin k of x where k is of course I have told you k square is 2 m e by h bar square. Okay. If you do not know how to get this solution my suggestion is that you substitute this solution in the above equation and see that this psi of x satisfies this equation which is very easy to see for yourself. Okay. d psi by dx if you recall when psi is a cos kx plus b sin kx you know what is d psi by dx dx it is minus k a sin kx plus k b cos kx. Therefore the derivative d square psi by dx square the second derivative is minus k square a cos kx minus k square b sin kx which is nothing other than minus k square psi of x and therefore you see that the equation is the same as what we started with d square psi by dx square plus k square psi is equal to 0. Therefore the solution makes sense. Okay. The method of solving how we get this all these things is not necessarily part of the chemistry course but you have to learn mathematics at the same time to solve simple differential equations. Let me leave it at that. Our point is to make sense out of the solutions as I said earlier. Now given that the wave function is this a cosine kx plus b sine kx and given the model if you recall the model v is infinite at the ends of the box x is equal to 0 and x is equal to l and if we are solving the Schrodinger equation for the particle inside the box and we say that psi of x is the solution then the presence this is infinite potential means that the wave function goes to 0 at x is equal to 0 the wave function vanishes goes to 0 at x is equal to l that is a model. Therefore the two conditions that we have psi of x is 0 at x is equal to 0. Psi of x is equal to 0 also at x is equal to l. These are the two conditions that we have to remember. Since these two conditions refer to the motion of the particle with respect to a boundary you can also call these as the boundary conditions. You can call this as the boundary conditions because the particle is bounded by these two limits. Therefore let us apply these boundary conditions to the solution that we have. Psi of x is equal to a cosine kx plus b sin kx is such that 
it vanishes at both the boundaries of the box. Okay. So let us take x is equal to 0, psi of 0 should be 0 and that means a cosine of 0 plus b sine of 0, sin 0 is 0 therefore this term goes away, cos 0 is 1, cosine 0 is 1 therefore this is a implies a is equal to 0. Okay. One of the two constants is removed by one of the boundary conditions. The next solution, next condition is psi of L is equal to 0 and that implies, now since A is 0, you recall psi of X is B sin Kx only. Therefore, what is psi of L? Psi of L is B sin K of L and this has to be 0 as required by the boundary condition psi of L is 0, the wave function vanishes at the other boundary. Again it is a very simple choice if you want to make, you know, B can be 0, but the point is if B is 0 and A is 0, then psi is a trivial solution, it is a useless solution. Okay. After all this differential equation is always, this differential equation is always satisfied by the trivial requirement that psi is 0. We are not looking for trivial solutions, we are looking for non-trivial solutions. Therefore, B with the condition that B is not necessarily 0. Then psi of L goes to 0 only if sin KL goes to 0 okay. and that is easy to understand because you know what a sine function does. A sine function when you plot sine of X as you go from X is equal to 0 to all the way up, you see sin of 0 is 0, sin of pi by 2 is 1, sin of pi is 0, sin of 2 pi is 0, 3 pi is 0 and so on. Therefore, you see that the condition KL, sin KL is equal to 0 implies KL is equal to n pi where n equal to 1, 2, 3, 4, etc. Again, n equal to 0 is not acceptable for the same reason that B is equal to 0 is not acceptable. Okay. So, KL is equal to n pi is the requirement that you get by solving the Schrodinger equation with the boundary conditions that the wave function vanishes at one end of the boundary as well as at the other end of the boundary. Okay. So, let us write the solution carefully. Therefore, K is equal to n pi by L, K square is equal to n square pi square by L square. Now this is purely mathematical. Our equation was psi of x is equal to B sin Kx which is N pi by L x now. Interesting thing is K square which we wrote earlier for 2Me by h bar square okay, is now n square pi square by l square where n equal to 1, 2, 3 etc. Values of n other than integers are not allowed and what does this tell you? E is equal to h bar square n square pi square by l square times 2 sorry divided by divided by 2 m. Okay. Now, you know that h bar square is h square by 4 pi square, h bar is h by 2 pi. Therefore, into n square into pi square by 2 m l square gives you E is equal to n square h square by 8 m l square. This is E. Okay. So, you move this and put it right in the middle. Okay. So, the energy of the particle, the possible solutions h psi is equal to E psi for that is the equation. 
the solutions for h psi is equal to e psi. Now you see for this particle in a box model with the boundary conditions that psi of x is a sign function vanishing at the ends of the boundary. But the possible energies that the particle can have are now discrete, not possible for any value of n but only n equal to 1, n equal to 2, n equal to 3 and so on. So the energy of the particle solution, the energy solution for the particle is h square by 8 ml square times n square an integer. Okay. Therefore 1, 4, 9, 16, 25 times this constant h square by 8 ml square. These are the possible energies for the particle. Therefore the discreteness of the energy of the particle appears immediately as a requirement of the boundary conditions. The quantization of the energy of the particle, the quantization of the electron, the moving electron in say a conjugated diene. The electron cannot have any arbitrary energies, but if it is bounded by the requirement that it stays with the molecule, that it does not fly off from the molecule that boundedness requires that the electrons to have only specific energies. Okay. We are talking about chemistry, we are not talking about particle in a box only. That is a model which is applied to the chemical problem should give you results which are in tandem with the chemical observations. Therefore, the simple model which gives you discretization or quantization of the energy arises, this discretization arises because of the requirement of the boundary conditions. Therefore, boundary conditions impose quantization. Quantization. Okay. The second thing, we have solved for psi of x as some constant, we still do not know what that constant is. We have b sin n pi x by L and the energy is given by that. Anyway, before I do that, let us just check when we write the energy as h square by 8 m L square times n square. Does it make sense? What are the dimensions of h? What are the dimensions of m and L? H is Planck's constant. Typically of the order of 10 raised to minus 34 joule second. I am leaving out the numbers. Let me just give you what is called an order of magnitude, few orders here and there, but an approximate calculation. H is that. It is joule second and you recall joule is kilogram meter square per second square times second. Therefore, what you have is per second. This goes away and therefore, you are left with kilogram meter square per second. This is for h. h square is that. h square has the dimension kilogram meter square per second whole square. m mass of the particle in kilograms. If you talk about atoms, if you talk about electrons, the mass is approximately of the order of 10 raised to minus 30 kilograms. If you talk about atoms, the masses are approximately in the range of 10 raised to minus 27 kilograms. Again extremely small. But you see these numbers are no longer uh, so small or so big compared to the height, the Planck's constant. M is of the M has the dimension kilogram, L length. The, the atomic dimensions, all of you know, is of the order of angstroms, 10 raised to minus 8 centimeters, that is 10 raised to minus 10 meters. So if L has the dimension of meter and H kilogram meter square per second inverse mass is kilogram, then you see the unit, this unit h square by m l square, leave the 8 out, what is the dimension? Kilogram square 
meter to the power 4 se second to the minus 2 by kilogram mass L square is meter square. So get all these things out you get a kilogram you get a meter square kilogram meter square per second square therefore that has the same dimension as the energy. This is the unit of energy for the particle in a box h square by 8 m l square is the unit times n square the quantum number the discrete integer with 1, 2, 3 as the possible values which we call as quantum numbers because it represents the quantization of the energy gives you the energy of the particle inside the box. What about the wave functions? Psi of x is equal to b sin n pi x by l. Okay. Let us do this for n equal to 1 psi 1 of x meaning that n equal to let us call this as psi n of x whatever is the value of n that is the same value. So psi 1 of x is b sin pi x by l easy to plot this it is a sine graph between the limits 0 and L it is a half sine wave vanishing at both ends and this is the value of B. What is the meaning of psi? It is a billion dollar question. Nobody knows that psi has an interpretation. You recall from my last lecture that we will solve the Schrodinger equation. We will have a lot of difficulty trying to understand the solutions of the Schrodinger equation but with one clear conscious mind that psi does not have an interpretation that the solution that we obtain does not have a meaning. If you ask me why are we going through all these things? Well this is not the end point of your learning using psi but rather the psi square psi into psi and if the wave function psi is complex using the absolute psi square Max Born provided the interpretation that psi square evaluated in a small region of space is the same as the probability of finding the system in that space. Let us go back to the slides. What is the meaning of psi? If the wave function that we have right now is a sine function but if it is a complex function for some other problem the absolute square of psi psi star calculated in a small region of space d tau represents the probability of finding the system in a small space d tau. Okay. This is the interpretation provided by Max Born and if you think it is hard you must also understand that Erwin Schrodinger who proposed this equation for solving the atomic systems dynamics as well as the stationary energy levels. Schrodinger himself did not get the, the role of psi correctly. His proposal of what the psi means was in fact turned down and several years later it was Max Born whose interpretation Max Born who gave the correct interpretation and which is now accepted universally as the interpretation for the wave function. Psi does not have a meaning absolute value of psi square has a meaning related to the probability. Now we talk about the small space here if you recall the particle moves in the box between x is equal to 0 to L therefore for this coordinate any small region is a dx the length dx intermediate. Therefore you calculate the wave function psi of x at that point and then interpret the absolute square of the wave function. Psi x square dx represents the probability of finding the particle in the small space between x and x plus dx. Let me write this out the meaning of psi.
none. The absolute value of psi square, absolute value psi square, the square of the absolute value, sorry. the absolute value is psi square since in our case it is a real function psi of x square dx represents the probability of finding the particle in the region bounded by x and x plus dx. It is psi square x, please remember psi square x. Okay. Therefore, we have a wave function psi which is a sine function. So, we can calculate psi square which is nothing but a sin square function and we plot sin square as a function of x and then you see that in each small region or a strip narrow space that the value of psi square gives you the probability of finding the particle in that region. If psi of x is sin b there is a constant b sin n phi x by l psi square is obviously b square sin square n phi x by l. So, if you plot that this is nothing again another oscillatory function it is a sin square therefore, if it is 0 and l probably something like that. Okay. Now, this is x is equal to 0 and x is equal to l. What is on this axis? The maximum value here is b square now. The probability of locating the particle in this region for x is equal to some value here and between x plus dx. This is psi square dx representing the area of this psi square graph in this small strip. Since x is a continuous variable, you can represent the probability in any small region of space by choosing that value of the variable. Therefore, what happens if we add all these probabilities that the particle be here in this region, the particle be in this region, in this region, let us add all these probabilities. What should we get? Now, that is important because you recall that the potential was taken to be infinite at the ends of the box to ensure that the particle stays in the box. Therefore, if you calculate all these probabilities in every region, if you calculate the total area of this graph, it is like finding the particle anywhere between x is equal to 0 and x is equal to L, which is absolute value, absolutely certain value namely 1. Therefore, when you add all these areas, small areas, that is equivalent to integrating psi square x dx between the limits x is equal to 0 and x is equal to L and that should give you an absolute value of 1 certainty. There is no leakage of this particle outside the boundary, through the boundary. The boundary is too steep. Okay. Therefore, this rigid model first of all gives us a picture of how things are different in the quantum world as opposed to the classical mechanical world. And unfortunately for a chemist all the atoms and molecules that we talk about are microscopic in dimensions and they do follow the quantum principles. You have to excite the atoms and molecules to very large values before you can think about applying classical physical laws. Spectroscopy for example, you have to study this quantum principle in order to understand basic tenets of spectroscopy. Okay. Now, x square dx is equal to 1. This tells you immediately that between x is equal to 0 to x is equal to L, b square, you remember b is a constant sin square n pi x by L dx should be equal to 1. This is an elementary integral. 
elementary integral all of you should know how to solve that. So, I leave that as an exercise, but the answer is b square into L by 2 is equal to 1. The value of the integral is L by 2, therefore, what is b? b is equal to root 2 by L. So, simple particle in a one dimensional box model, now what you have is these two ideas, namely that the energy is quantized, the energy of the particle if we measure it should be one of the values that we wrote down h square m square times by 8 ml square. The wave function is has the meaning that the absolute square of the wave function in a small region gives you the probability of finding the particle in that region. Let me summarize that therefore, as the solutions of the particle in the one dimensional box are solutions for the h psi is equal to e psi psi of x is equal to now root 2 by L sin n pi x by L and E is h square by 8 m L square n square where n equal to 1, 2, 3 etcetera. Therefore, when you try to solve this Schrodinger equation h psi is equal to E psi you did not get one solution, you got an infinitely many solutions. n can be any value for 1, 2, 3, can be all the way up to infinity. Therefore, the corresponding wave functions are also there are infinite number of such wave functions. Okay. So, this is another nice thing about solving the Schrodinger equation is you will obtain practically everywhere all the solutions that need you need to know. Let us now go back to the slides. I have already mentioned the probability concept and I have told you that the integration of the psi square dx is equal to 1 is nothing is often known in quantum mechanics as a normalization condition. The normalization condition merely refers to the fact that the total probability of finding the system with that wave function everywhere in that system should be unity that is the normalization condition adding all the probabilities and that immediately gives you a value for the b in terms of the dimensions of the problem namely 1 by square root of L the length. Okay. You can see here the wave functions plotted for various values n equal to 1 I already drew this as a half wave sine wave. When n is 2 you see that the wave function is a full wave function. Let us plot the wave functions. Sin pi x by L, no problem, it is a half sine wave. Sin 2 pi x by L for n equal to 2. When x goes from 0 to L, sin 2 pi x by L goes from sin 0 to sin 2 pi therefore, it is a full wave, it is a full sine wave therefore, it goes to 0 at half this point and the next one is sin 3 pi x by L which you can immediately tell me is a 1 and a half sine wave. So, what you have is So, 1 and a half sine wave. Okay. Now, that is for the sine wave. What about for the sine square wave which represents the probability? There is no negative part. The sine square is something like that. The sine square, this is sine square pi x by L. Sine square 2 pi x by L now has a node which is something like that, no negative parts, two equal halves and sin square 3 pi x by L has three such equal halves, the one thirds and the sin square 4 pi x has four one fourths and so on, which is what you see in this slide. 
this is the sine wave here the first one is the sine pi x sine 2 pi x by L sine square pi x sine square 2 pi x by L 3 sine square 3 4 sine square 4 and so on. So as this goes on and on as, as the n value increases to very very large values you will see that the graph is practically lots of oscillations but very very tightly placed that when you try to measure the probability in any small region for particles with such large values of n you will get a uniform probability independent of the region which is the same as the classical idea that is for large values of n we do not need to solve the quantum mechanical equations the classical mechanical equations and the concepts of classical mechanics make sense this you must have also recognized something as the Bohr's correspondence principle where quantum mechanics and classical mechanics meet anyway these are not important right now for us we are looking at it from the point of view of the uh, solutions of the chemical systems the summary for the 1D box now is that the wave function is root 2 by L sin n pi x by L and the energies are h square by 8 ml square n square particle energies are discrete particle position inside the box given by a probability description let us digress this for one minute the probability idea let me play this movie for you and explain what this movie does okay. let us assume that we are able to follow the motion of the particle by looking at a narrow window inside the box at any point of time assuming all other things to be identical if the particle is moving with a constant velocity inside the box as we would expect if there is no potential energy Newton's first law tells you particles in motion will continue to be in motion particles in rest will continue to be in rest there is no potential there is no force therefore the particle will continue to move with its velocity constant therefore if we try to locate the particle by looking at any small region delta x1 which is given by this band the probability that we will find the particle in delta x1 is given by this ratio delta x1 the window divided by the total length of the window that is the box length itself p1 is equal to delta x1 by l this is the classical picture that we have in terms of locating the particle in terms of finding where the particle is probably to be present there is one more movie and what is important is that this p1 delta x1 by l is independent of where the delta x1 is that is what this uh, strip is moving around to tell you whether the delta x1 is centered at this point or it is centered here or it is centered here it does not matter the, so long as the delta x1 is the same width the probability is the same value if we increase that band obviously the probability is now much larger and if we can look at the whole box we will anyway locate the particle okay but what is important in the classical idea is that independent of the particles velocity independent of the location of the particle inside the box the probabilities are the same so long as you are looking at the narrow region of the same length in various domains this is the classical idea now what do you get out of the quantum mechanical picture see what you have here is on this side on the right hand side of your picture you see that this graph represents the particles uh, the size square therefore this is the probability density graph this is not the same everywhere meaning the likelihood of locating the particle in this small region is different from the value in this region if the particles energy is E1 namely h square by 8 m l square n is 1 if n is 2 the particles energies are now different and the probability density curve is also different it is not only not the same in all regions it is also different for different energies of the particle 
So you see that the quantum mechanical picture, if the electron were to be closely to be located from the hydrogen nucleus, the likelihood of finding the electron in a region close to the nucleus, the likelihood of finding the same electron in a region farther away from the nucleus, they are not going to be one and the same if we have to follow this uh, wave function picture. Second, even if the electron has the same energy in one orbit for example, the analog of a Bohr orbit, in different regions of the electron's domain with that same energy, the electron is likely to be located in different probable with different probabilities. Therefore, you see the quantum idea, the Schrodinger equation introduces concepts which are foreign to us. Which are quantum mechanics itself is a sort of a strange idea and the derivations from that give us really strange results which we cannot comprehend. The only way to see that these results are no longer strange is by knowing more and more about similar systems, by solving more difficult problems and interpreting our results in, along these lines and then finally coming to the agreement that even if I do not understand quantum mechanics, I know how it works. Given a problem, I know how to solve that problem and I would be able to obtain the solutions for the electron densities, say for example, in a molecule. Okay. Eventually that is what we would want to do as chemists is to map out the electron densities of the electrons in various atoms, in molecules and to show where are the electron depleting regions, where are the electron enriched regions, where is the bonding, is the bonding directly related to the electron density present in that region or a depletion of electron density means no bonding, anti-bonding, you know all these words, but how do we interpret them using the quantum mechanical idea? Since we want to get to that point as quickly as possible, we have to show the basic mathematics, but let us not try and understand every bit of these detail before we move on. This is particle in the box model gives you two important concepts namely discretization of the energy as a function, as a result of boundary condition and that the probability densities being different for different regions. If we have to extend this idea of the motion of the particle in a one dimension to the motion of the particle in two dimensions namely in a plane, not along a line but in a plane, if we have to do that, then corresponding expressions for the kinetic energy of the particle, if you recall that the minus, the term minus h bar square by 2 m d square by d x square represented the momentum p x square. And in two dimensions, what you have is the momentum of the electron or the particle moving in a plane okay, is not p x square the momentum p square is p x square plus p y square. You recall the momentum p is the vector with p x as the component along the x direction and p y as the component along the y direction and the absolute square p square is nothing but the p dotted p vector. Okay. So now you have two components of momenta in two mutually orthogonal directions and therefore this term which is unique for a particle in one dimension has to be modified to be written such that you have the two dimensional kinetic energy minus h bar square by 2 m dou square by dou x square plus dou square by dou y square. This is the analog now of the classical mechanical p square for a two dimensional system. It is a partial derivative now meaning that whenever you evaluate the function under this derivative, you keep the other variable constant. This is the kinetic energy operator or a particle in a two dimension. And obviously the particle's potential energy is now a function of both the coordinates x and y because the position of a point in a plane is given by two coordinates. Therefore, the potential that the particle experiences at that point is given by its value for both these coordinates. Therefore, V is now a function of x and y. This is the kinetic, this is the potential energy operator. Now, 
Therefore, the Schrodinger equation for this particle now becomes for the solution H psi is equal to E psi to be written explicitly the equation is minus H bar square by 2 m dou square by dou x square plus dou square by dou y square psi of x comma y the wave function is a function of both the variables x and y plus v of x comma y times psi of x comma y is equal to E h psi is equal to E psi of x comma y. Okay. This is the equation that we have to solve a motion in two dimension. This is for particle in a two dimensional box. Okay. Some of you might be worried about the fact I am drawing a two dimensional box and I call this as a one dimensional model and therefore if I have to draw a two dimensional box model it has to be a cubic. What does this mean? The one dimension here represents the variable to which with respect to which we are solving the Schrodinger equation. We are solving an equation in one variable that is what we call as the dimension. This is only a boundary to indicate that the particle cannot escape the box. Therefore, in a two dimensional motion likewise what you need to do is not to write a, a line but a box somewhat like that. And perhaps you can just tell you that this is something like a box. Okay. So now you are talking about the motion of the particle in two dimensions referring to the fact that one of them is the x variable the other is the y variable the position of the particle in this plane or any plane is what is meant by the problem the model problem particle in a two dimensional box. So let me summarize now for today's lecture what we try to do is we introduce to the model problem of a particle in a one dimensional box and its relevance to chemistry in terms of following the electron energies in a specific example being that of a conjugated diene system. Okay. There are many other similar instances in chemistry where this model has to be solved. But our purpose is having associated uh, the solution with a corresponding chemical problem we went through the motion of the solution of the system and what is the meaning associated with the wave function or its absolute square and the fact that the energy is a discrete quantity how do we come up with that how do we arrive at that that the boundary conditions are important for discretization of the energy. So these are the things that we have to remember as the consequences of solving the model problem and the results being different from our classical perception of the dynamical motion of the particle in the sense of classical mechanics. With these differences in the next lecture I would continue to illustrate the particle in a two dimensional box and there will be one surprise namely the concept of degeneracy that will arise when we solve the particle in a two dimensional box in addition to everything that we had done now namely the quantization of the energies, the probability description but in addition to that we will have what are called the degeneracies that will arise and therefore that is important to recognize as the next important step. Until then thank you very much.